So before we continue with the business at hand, I'd like to take a minute to remember and memorialize the horrific events that happened on this date 22 years ago. I'm sure we all remember where we were, what we were doing, what we were feeling on that day. So please join me in a moment of silence in memory of those lives lost on that day and those who lost their lives at later times due to the events of the day and in honor of those who lost their loved ones on that day. Thank you for sharing that moment. Those of you who um, have not logged in before and don't know me, I'm Rio Markowitz. I'm from the Georgia Cancer Center and I'm part of the hub team of our Teladerm project. Uh, Dr. Patton is unable to be here today. Um, he and I usually co-facilitate these sessions. So Dr. Buchanan is stepping in and um, will be co-facilitating with me. Uh, hopefully everyone has their screens on gallery view so we can see each other and, and have your cameras on uh, unless you have any bandwidth problems. I want to welcome our teledermatology clinic healthcare providers uh, who are logged in from their various clinics throughout the state of Georgia. And we will we may have some new people here because we are adding in a couple of new clinics uh, within the next few weeks. So we welcome um, all of uh, you new folks. I uh, want to welcome our dermatologists, Dr. Davis, Dr. Rabinovitz, Dr. Buchanan. Uh, we probably have some dermatology residents here, actually one of our speakers. And um, there may be medical students, uh, then residents from family medicine and, um, and others. And then I want to introduce the members of our hub team who are handling the controls here, Kenza Mamuni Hi, and Brenda Santiano. Uh, we couldn't do this without our team. Please remember to write in the chat uh, who you are, your full name, your clinic, your email address, um, and what you uh, what your affiliation is. And there are already some uh, or samples posted in the chat of that. So let's review today's agenda. Uh, we have our introduction, of course. Uh, Dr. Silas Money, um, a uh, PGY3 dermatology resident, will present our um, the didactic portion today. Uh, and then we'll have a case presentation by fourth year medical student Mishma Farsi. And then we'll have our discussion and wrap up and announcements. So the, uh, today's presentation will be sun protection do's and don'ts, which will remind us that skin protection is needed year round. And uh, now I will introduce Dr. Buchanan, who will take over today's session. And uh, Dr. Buchanan's a member of our Department of Dermatology here at AU, and she practices at AU's Care Center for Dermatology in Aiken, South Carolina. So, Dr. Buchanan. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. And I'll try to do um, as good of a job as Dr. Patton, but I might fall short. Um, but so we're going to just start today with a few announcements. Um, this is just our general slide about Project ECHO, moving knowledge instead of people. And this is an extension for community health care outcomes. We can go to the next slide. So 
The goal of this project is to improve knowledge by telemedicine at the local level and use distance learning approaches to help dissolve the dermatologic health disparities faced by people living in rural areas in the state of Georgia. So, you know, just a few reminders as we go through today's session, um, just make sure you um, keep your, your screen on in that gallery view. Make sure to keep yourself muted. Um, you know, you, you can feel free to ask questions once we get to the wrap up portion. Um, and then you can always raise your hand as well and just make sure you introduce yourself whenever you speak. And um, if you have any technical issues throughout today, just e you can type them in the chat or you can email Kenza. Um, and I think that about covers it for the beginning part. And so we're going to start today with a colleague of mine, Dr. Silas Money. Um, he is, like Rhea said, a PGY3 resident, and um, he's going to be talking today about sun protection, do's and don'ts. You know, we're getting a little bit out of this um, hot, humid season, but still important. Sun protection is year round. And so I would like to introduce Dr. Money and he will take it away. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Buchanan for the introduction. Uh, very excited to be with you all today and give this talk on sun protection. It's definitely a, you know, a more straightforward topic. Um, something that we talk about all day, every day with patients, but it's, I think it's certainly a very high impact recommendation you can make for patients, no matter what specialty you're in, especially for patients who are at higher risk for skin cancer or high risk for anything that's a photosensitive rash. So with that, we'll get started. I don't have any conflicts of interest as closed for this presentation. All right, so our objectives for today, first, you know, we're talking about sun protection. First, I think we need to understand what are we protecting from? So just go a little bit more into detail on UV radiation, uh, different wavelengths of UV, UV radiation and how sunscreens might protect uh, against various wavelengths, and then talk about the short and long-term effects of UV radiation. We'll then describe just a basic overview of sun protective measures, and this is what you would recommend to your patients um, during a visit, um, you know, sunscreen, sun protective clothing, et cetera. And then lastly, I'll go into more detail on tips for applying sunscreen correctly and how to choose a sunscreen because it's certainly overwhelming choosing uh, from the various brands and types. Okay, so first this chart here is a lot going on, uh, but the point is to talk about UV radiation, which is uh, one type of solar radiation. So solar radiation involves UV radiation, visible light, even some infrared wavelengths, but UV radiation is of um, relevance to us because not only does it enter through Earth's atmosphere, but it also has a biological effect on the skin, which is sun damage. Um, and it's subdivided into UV, C, B, and A. You can see the numbers there corresponding to the wavelengths. It's not important to remember those wavelengths for the purposes of our discussion, um, but if you just remember UVB and UVA are the main wavelengths of UV radiation that both reach Earth's surface and have a biological effect on the skin, and that becomes relevant when discussing uh, the short-term and long-term effects of UV, UV on the skin, as well as various um, sunscreens and which ones they may protect against. Okay, you can see in the chart on the right, uh, first wavelength is UVC. It's actually completely filtered out by Earth's atmosphere. It's absorbed by ozone and oxygen, doesn't reach Earth's surface. But UVB is the wavelength um, of a higher energy that does reach Earth's surface, at least to some extent. About 5% of UV radiation that reaches us is UVB. And then UVA, you can see most of it actually does reach us. And so the majority of UV exposure we see on Earth is UVA and a minor component UVB. We'll talk about how UVB is actually the more damaging of the two. All right, so talking about short-term versus long-term effects of UV radiation on the skin, short-term effects, very simple. It's just sunburn and then tanning. On the left, you see a classic sunburn. Um, it's a good example, too, of how clothing can be very protective from the sun. Um, he had bad sunburn just on that exposed area of the neck. 
this is predominantly a UVB mediated effect. Um, just that 5% of UV that reaches us, which is UVB, is able to um, cause that acute damage to the skin. On the right, you can see classic tanning. Um, this is predominantly UVA, also some UVB. Um, I think a good example is that tanning beds mainly use UVA uh, you know, at a much higher dose than what we normally receive just being outside. Uh, but it's both UVA and UVB that cause tanning. Now going into long-term effects. So the first one is photoaging. Um, you know, a good way to think about this is just wrinkles, fine lines, and changes in texture of the skin. This photo shows a great example of how UVA plays a very large role in photoaging. So this particular lady sat next to a window at her desk as a secretary for about 20 years. Um, and the left side of her face was facing the window. Windows filter out UVB. So it's only UVA that reaches us through windows. And you can see the effects over 20 years that just that daily prolonged dose of UVA on her skin had. Um, right side of her face, uh, in very good shape. The left side has changes that we see with extensive chronic sun exposure, um, you can even see some cysts and comedones that can come up with chronic sun damage as well as deep resting lines. And this is pr predominantly a UVA mediated process. Now getting into the more dangerous of the two long-term effects, this is photocarcinogenesis. This is just chronic UV exposure, which causes DNA damage. So DNA acts as a chromophore for UV radiation. It absorbs UV radiation and uh, induces changes which eventually can lead to mutations in important genes, either tumor suppressor genes or oncogenes, which then can lead to skin cancer formation over many years. Um, so photocarcinogenesis is really, um, you know, from a dermatology standpoint, the main thing that we want to prevent with sun protection. All right, so just a general overview of sun protection. This is what you can, you know, uh, either have a, a pamphlet for a handout or just have you know, a quick discussion that um, you can have with your patients about how to protect themselves from the sun and the best way that works for them. First is just sun avoidance. Um, this one's pretty self-explanatory. If it's a really bright and sunny day, high UV index, um, particularly in the middle of the day, you want to avoid being out in the sun. That's the best way to avoid sun damage. Um, second, if you have to be out in it, and we all do at some point, um, is shade seeking behavior. So you have a street, um, usually one sidewalk is in the sun, one sidewalk's in the shade, just choose the shaded side. Uh, next is sun protective clothing. Uh, as you saw in the photo with the sunburn, um, even just ordinary clothing is fairly protective from the sun, but there are um, lots of specially made sun protective clothing items uh, that we recommend to patients. Um, and then lastly is sunscreen. So sunscreen, it should be viewed as more of a last line of defense. You know, the other things are things that you can incorporate uh, fairly easy into your daily routine. Sunscreen is that last line of protection, but equally as important that you incorporate into your regimen. And then lastly, I will discuss for certain patients, we recommend oral supplementation that um, is even further sun, uh, you know, sun protective. All right, first, so sun, sun avoidance. Um, the middle of the day is when the UV index is highest. And UV index, it's a pretty complicated calculation. It's not important to understand what it is, but it does just correlate with your risk of getting a sunburn when you're outside. So any UV index of three or more is at least a moderate risk of sunburn. And you wanna make patients where they should take precautions when there's um, a UV index of three or greater. So we tell patients avoid being outside during the middle of the day. That's you know, 10 a.m. to around 4 p.m. because the radiation's at its peak. Um, now, one thing is a lot of people will slack off on sun protection on cloudy days, or let's say they go somewhere where it's cold, or if they go skiing. Um, those are situations where you can actually get really bad sunburns because um, you know, temperature does not really affect UV exposure even if it's really cold in the winter time or if it's cloudy, there's still a lot of UV radiation reaching through. You need to be careful, um, especially if you're around reflective surfaces like snow, sand, or concrete. That reflection from that will um, still give you a high exposure to UV. Shade-seeking behavior. This is a good example, as I said, 
it's easy if you're walking down the street, just choose the shaded sign. Um, you know, we walk back and forth between our dermatology clinic and the medical office building and our administrative office on Chafee Avenue. Um, you know, just waiting at the crosswalk every day for five, 10 minutes a day. Um, easy to just step off to the side, stand under a tree where there's shade rather than standing on the bright sidewalk where you're getting direct sun exposure. Just that over the years makes a big difference in how much sun you're getting. Um, patients can use an umbrella. Um, yeah, I think that it's a little bit cumbersome to carry on an umbrella with you everywhere, but if you have a regular walk like that back and forth from your office, not a bad idea to have an umbrella. Uh, and like I said, um, potential pitfall of staying in the shade is it's not entirely protective because if there's bright concrete or asphalt nearby, it is reflecting UV back towards you. All right, now into sun protective clothing. So the main things that we recommend are a broad rimmed hat, at least three to four inches with the um, rim to protect the ears and the nose, sunglasses, particularly ones that cover the entire periorbital region, and extend onto the temple to cover as much of that as possible. Um, long sleeved, tightly woven clothing. So you don't want uh, a loose cover up, you want something that's really not letting anything through and preferably in darker colors. So darker colors are uh, more protective than lighter colors like white or yellow. And then um, a scarf or a neck gaiter, depending on the season, something to cover the neck because that's just a frequently overlooked area that gets a lot of sun over the years. You know, sun protective clothing, um, I think for a lot of patients, especially, you know, we see a lot of older men who are just not going to put on sunscreen, but it is easy to put on a hat or just put on a long sleeve shirt, a fishing shirt, something that's going to give you some sun protection. So it's a, a good tool to have in the toolbox. Um, when you're looking at sun protective clothing, you want to look for the UPF factor. So this is similar to SPF, but UPF is ultraviolet protection factor. And it's actually the, it's um, correlates with the amount of sunlight that passes through clothing. So UPF 50 allows one 50th of sun to pass through the clothing. Um, so it blocks 98% of the sun. Um, and we recommend just like sunscreen, UPF 30 plus to have optimal protection. Um, one pitfall is wet clothing. Actually, with it contacting the skin actually lets through a lot more UV. So you want to have on dry clothing to be most protective. And then of course, pretty self-explanatory, but loosely fitting clothing or loosely woven clothing is not very protective. All right, this is just a good example. We see so many patients for skin checks who have this terrible sun damage on the scalp, the forearms, the hands. These are really low hanging fruit for sun protective clothing. Um, you know, recommend that patients use wear a hat anytime they're outdoors, especially if they're bald. And then the forearms and hands, um, you know, that's pretty easy to cover up with long sleeve shirts or even gloves while driving. Um, just a, a light, a pair of light cotton gloves is good while driving because that's where we get a lot of that UVA over the years is while we're driving. We see worse sun, da sun damage a lot of the time on the left side, left side of the face, left arm, left hand, because that's our driving side, as Dr. Davis always teaches us, um, gets all of that UVA through the left side of the car. If you have patients who aren't fans of wearing sunglasses, this should be a little motivation for them. We see a lot of basal cell carcinoma on the periorbital region, particularly right on the eyelid. Uh, on the left is a more subtle one, but you know they can be pretty impressive. And these are something that we need to be looking for because you'd be surprised patients can have something uh, like this lesion on the right and not be concerned about. It. They don't know what it is, but they're not really concerned about. It. So you need to be looking um, and also recommend that they wear a very protective pair of sunglasses. So protect it from cataracts, also protects from skin cancers on the eyelids. All right, getting into sunscreen. This is probably the most um, complex part of this talk because sunscreen is a little bit of an overwhelming um, topic because there's so many available, so many different brands, so many different types. Patients have a lot of questions about sunscreen. Um, but first, sunscreens, they are regulated by the FDA as an over-the-counter medicine because they, they alter the structure or function of skin. So they're regulated in that way. So um, I think there are patients who are concerned about the safety of sunscreens. So it's good to let them know these, the active ingredients are regulated, the safety labeling is regulated and then how they calculate the SPF, the precision of that is regulated. 
So there are two main types, chemical and physical. And first, chemical sunscreens, again, the, just the name might um, you know, dissuade some patients just because of concerns about putting chemicals on their skin. You could just call it an organic soluble filter. So an organic filter of UV light, and that's all they are. So um, there are different categories of chemical filters, but the, the benzones and the salicylates are the most common. They're often in combination just because they achieve different things. Um, it's not particularly important to choose a specific chemical ingredient sunscreen. Some of the older ones, uh, like the PABA containing ones, can stain clothing, but most of the newer ones don't. Um, so these work by absorbing UV light rather than um, scattering it or reflecting it. And that prevents absorption by chromophores in the skin, such as DNA, and prevents uh, you know, DNA damage by the sun. Um, one pitfall is patients who have very sensitive skin, like patients with atopic dermatitis or rosacea, they may get more irritation from chemical sunscreens, uh, particularly on the face, and they may benefit from either you know, more specially compounded brand or they may benefit from a physical mineral sunscreen. So that gets into physical sunscreens. These are the ones that um, you know, were some of the first to become available back in the 70s. This is zinc oxide, titanium dioxide containing sunscreens. Think of a thick white paste. Those are the older ones. Fortunately, a lot of the newer formulations are micronized and blend in much better. Um, these work by absorbing and scattering UV light um, rather than just absorbing like chemical sunscreens do. And some of these physical sunscreens, um, particularly the tinted ones, uh, have very broad coverage of even visible light. Okay, so sun protection factor, just a little background. SPF, it's basically... Um, you know, it's a measure of the protection, relative protection of a sunscreen. Um, it describes the amount of time it takes for skin to achieve sunburn when it's protected by the sunscreen as compared to unprotected skin from the sunscreen. So SPF 15 means that um, if it takes someone normally 10 minutes in the sun to burn with no sunscreen, SPF 15 sunscreen could potentially allow them to be in the sun 15 times longer before they get the same amount of sunburn. Uh, this varies person to person. Some people burn very quickly. Some people take longer to burn. Um, but in general, it's that measure of time in the sun. Um, now, this is a little bit different from UPF. I mentioned UPF is the fraction of sun that penetrates through clothing. So UPF 50 allows 1 50th of sunlight to penetrate. thus blocking 98%. SPF 15 is more of a measure of time in the sun. All right, and you can see the chart on the right, there's definitely, because SPF is calculated as a fraction, it levels off uh, starting around SPF 30, which is around 96% of UV blockage. So after SPF 30, there's really uh, not much additional benefit from higher levels of SPF, but most patients, studies have shown that most patients don't apply enough sunscreen. So if they're applying SPF 15 or SPF 30 and under applying, um, they're going to still get some significant sun exposure. So that's why, um, you know, applying a higher SPF like SPF 50 probably compensates for that under application of sunscreen. All right. So which sunscreen to use? Um, you know, we talked about physical and chemical sunscreens. That's not nearly as important as just recommending a broad spectrum, at least SPF 30 sunscreen. So that's, you know, key takeaway from this whole talk if you're going to recommend a sunscreen, it needs to be broad spectrum and it needs to be at least SPF 30. And broad spectrum, this goes back to talking about the different wavelengths of UV radiation. So broad spectrum is a sunscreen that blocks both UVA and UVB, uh, which can cause you know, sunburn, but also skin cancer and photoaging. So if someone's not motivated enough by preventing sunburn or preventing skin cancer, maybe appeal to their sense of vanity, this is going to make you more wrinkled make you look older at a younger age. Um, now, as with anything else, compliance is key. Read your patient, you know, decide what's going to work best for them and recommend based on that. Okay, so sunscreens, they come in many different forms. Now the sprays are very popular. Lotions probably achieve better coverage on the skin when they're applied properly. Sprays, it's easy to miss a spot, um, easy to have uneven coverage. And a lot of the sprays, Pretty much all of them contain alcohol, which can also be irritating, uh, particularly in people with dry or sensitive skin. So lotions are, um, you, know, you can't go wrong with a sunscreen lotion. Now regarding the brand, the brands are very overwhelming. 
But in general, the ones that are available on the shelf at um, drugstores, at the grocery store, almost all of those are um, entirely sufficient. Patients don't need to spend a ton of money on these expensive brands. Um, I would say unless they have um, issues with irritation or allergy to some of the common brands, then they might need to seek out one of the more expensive brands that's compounded um, either with ceramides or, or just with fewer preservatives to prevent irritation. Then lastly, there are sport formulations. Uh, these tend to have more water resistance, um, especially if you have patients who are going to be swimming, going to be sweaty, which is most of the time when we're outside. Um, these can be beneficial just to stay on the skin better. One of the relatively new things in the world of sunscreen are these daily facial moisturizers with SPF. Um, these are a little bit more pricey than just regular sunscreens, but um, it's, I think, a really good thing to incorporate just into a, a daily skincare routine is when you wash your face in the morning, put on a moisturizer that has at least SPF 30. They blend in very, very well, just like a normal moisturizer, but you're going to get at least some degree of that protection throughout the day. One thing also, the one of the most overlooked places for sun protection is the lips because, it, you know, we're constantly eating and drinking. Sunscreen, if you put on the lips, it gets wiped off. But lip balms with SPF are very useful. We see some really aggressive skin cancers on the lips. And also these stick applicators, um, they're, they're good for quick coverage on the nose or cheeks, um, you know, especially if you've already put on a base layer of lotion and you just want to reapply every two hours, you can use a stick to just roll it onto the nose or cheeks. And then lastly, tinted mineral sunscreens are also um, pretty popular right now. Um, they have very broad coverage, as I mentioned earlier, that includes visible light. Now, visible light, I didn't discuss it in terms of uh, you know, the biological effects on the skin. And that's because it's still not yet well understood, but um, there is some evidence to suggest that visible light um, could, over the, over the years, have some role in photocarcinogenesis, but we do know that it can, in people with photosensitive dermatoses like lupus or porphyrias, it can contribute to flares of those. So patients with those, we recommend a tinted mineral sunscreen just to get the absolute broadest coverage possible. And it's particularly um, useful for patients with skin of color. It blends in very well. Okay, so this is equally as important to recommending sunscreen as, as teaching a patient how to use it. So um, first, it's all exposed skin with outdoors. It's, it's um, pretty easy to just um, be lazy and put it just on your head, neck area. But, um, you know, even the legs, ankles, all of that, we see skin cancers everywhere where there's sun exposure. So it's important to get all areas. Like I said, SPF 30 or greater is what you're looking for. And a sunscreen that's labeled as broad spectrum that's going to block both UVA and UVB. Now, this is the part that's, you know, a little bit of a turnoff to patients. It's recommending you use one to two ounces, which is about a shot glass full of sunscreen to cover your entire body. Now, that's a lot. Most people aren't going to use that much. And that's why we recommend using at least SPF 30, um, you know, preferably SPF 50 in those patients who you really think aren't going to put on enough sunscreen because it compensates for not putting on enough. It's important to apply sunscreen about 15 minutes before you go outside. Um, just gives it time to really incorporate into the stratum corneum and give you the most protection, um, particularly a water-resistant sunscreen. You don't want it to wash off as soon as you get in the water. Um, it's important to reapply. This is a very key point. Um, you need to reapply every two hours or after swimming or excessively sweating because you lose a lot of that benefit um, from perspiration or getting in the water. And then lastly, spray sunscreens, pretty self-explanatory. Um, but um, they need to apply, be applied evenly and also pretty heavily to achieve the rated SPF, um, which is why uh, personally I prefer lotions. I just think that it's, it's easy to miss with the sprays. This comes up a um, fair bit. Um, so sunscreens in pregnancy and breastfeeding women, it's recommended to use physical sunscreens, um, which are the minerals, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, um, and avoiding the chemical sunscreens. Just, you know, for theoretical safety reasons, there haven't been any um, studies out there. You know, it's not, wouldn't be ethical to do those studies, but um, it's just for um, an abundance of caution, just recommended to use physical sunscreens. And then in infants younger than six months old, it's not recommended to use sunscreens. And in young children, we usually recommend 
uh, mineral sunscreens as well, just because of those theoretical safety concerns. All right, and lastly, oral supplementation. You know, this is something that's definitely not for everyone, but for patients who've had at least one skin cancer, have a very strong family history, they're concerned, or patients who are high risk, like transplant patients, patients who are immunosuppressed with CLL, um, or patients with any photosensitive conditions like lupus, we do recommend these quite a bit. So the first is HelioCare. It's available over the counter, any drugstore. Um, it's also on Amazon, easy to order. Uh, this is a an, actually a fern extract um, called fern block, and um, it reduces patients' uh, sensitivity to the sun, so their propensity to sunburn. They can either take it as a daily, twice daily supplement, or they can take it just 30 minutes before they go out in the sun. Um, either way, it works pretty well. Patients who take it are happy with it. Um, it's a bit pricey, um, but like I said, it's for select populations, not for everyone. And then second is niacinamide, also known as nicotinamide, not to be confused with niacin. So I've had, I've had some patients take niacin instead, get bad flushing, they're very unhappy. You need to emphasize that it's niacinamide. And if you look at the HelioCare there, that's actually HelioCare Advanced. It actually contains niacinamide. Just the regular HelioCare does not have niacinamide. But niacinamide is a vitamin B3 derivative. There was a phase three randomized controlled trial published uh, in recent years in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that when taken 500 milligrams twice daily in patients who'd had at least two skin cancers, it reduced the rate of new basals and squames by 20 and 30% respectively, and AKs by between 30 and 20%. So pretty promising results in that study. We've certainly had patients who have had similar results. Um, interestingly, more recently, there was a study published in the New England Journal that showed this benefit does not carry over into transplant patients, which is very unfortunate because we're always looking for ways to reduce the rates of skin cancers that are um, carry a high morbidity. Just a couple of other considerations when talking about sun protection. Um, you know, screen your patients who would really um, you know, be a higher need for needing sun protection. These are people with lupus, porphyria, or any immunosuppression that puts them at risk of skin cancer. And then also think about their medication list. So this is something we see a lot, patients who take HCTZ or other thiazides, they're uh, photosensitizing, they get more skin cancers over time. Or if a patient's on a prolonged course of tetracycline antibiotics, um, those patients may need more sun protection and, or any other meds that increase risk of skin cancer, which are mostly immunosuppressants like tacrolimus, prednisone, et cetera. Just some resources for patients. The Skin Cancer Foundation website has some really good resources for patients that are uh, explained in a way that pretty much anyone can understand. And also the American Academy of Dermatology, the AD, their website has some good resources, but also practice resources like pamphlets for your practice to hand out. All right, that's it for my talk. Uh, any questions? I have a question. Is there any, um, the efficacy of the sunscreen is the same with the when the patient mix uh, the sunscreen with the face uh, with a face cream, any kind of face cream? Some patients tend to mix them when they use like sunscreen with color or because of the consistency of the sunscreen. Yeah, no, it, it, it's fine to mix uh, sunscreen with a like a light facial moisturizer or cream. Yeah, that doesn't decrease their efficacy. So sure. I had a question similar to Brenda's, but when you're, as someone who uses moisturizer and foundation and so forth, what order do you use the sunscreen first and then everything else? Or do you put your moisturizer and your makeup and then sunscreen? What's, what's the right way to do it? Yeah, that's a great question too. I think that um, in some cases it may not be practical to do it like in a reverse order, like your makeup may not go on well if you've already put on sunscreen. So bottom line, just whatever works best for you. I think we typically recommend putting on sunscreen last though, putting on sunscreen last to cover up the moisturizer, the makeup. I think we have one more hand raised. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, Silas, thank you for the discussion. Uh, my question is, um, what's your view 
about the use of sunscreen in uh, persons with pigmented skin, considering that they they don't have a lot of skin cancers. Uh, for us in Nigeria, we tend to recommend sunscreen because we think uh, they are because of the high exposure of sun, there's increased risk of hyperpigmentation. And the individuals who feel that they are getting darker tend to bleach their skin. So we tend to recommend uh, sunscreen because of that. But generally, what's your view and what's like the protocol? Protocol, do they, do they really need to apply every two hours? And other, other recommendations. Thank you. Yes, I think I think that's a great point. Um, you know, clearly increased melanin content in the skin offers much more natural sun protection. Um, it's not as imperative on a daily basis to apply sunscreen in skin of color, but um, I think that most importantly, you need to think about the patients with skin of color who have photosensitive dermatoses because we see a we tend to see a lot more of these in that population, like discoid lupus. Um, also being on photosensitizing medications, all of those, like you said, there'll be more just hyperpigmentation, but also over time, more risk for sun damage. We've seen some aggressive squamous cell carcinomas in patients with discoid lupus. Um, so you know, I don't think there's a, I don't know that we have guidelines on that. I think it's on a patient by patient basis, but I don't think our recommendation on how to apply sunscreen is differently in, in, in those patients that you deem it beneficial or necessary. I would, I would have the same recommendations for re reapplication every two hours. I'll just be careful about selecting the right type of sunscreen that the patient will prefer that will blend in well. Um, tinted mineral sunscreens are great, especially on the face. Um, I hope that it's, it's. I think that's a really good question. There's a lot of discussion to be had about that. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. Um, hopefully, I answered some parts of your question. Thank you, Dr. Money. That was excellent. Um, very great presentation. Lots of information for our patients. And I can't stress enough that the resources that he has at the end of the slide especially I know the AAD website has a lot of printable materials that you can hand to your patients that, you know, explain how to apply sunscreen, what the differences are between the chemical and physical sunscreen. So there's definitely a lot of information online for patients for, you know, with lighter skin types, as well as information for patients with darker skin types as well. Um, so we're going to go ahead and Move forward, we have Mishma Farsi today, who's going to be giving us a wonderful case presentation. Um, her and I have worked on this presentation for the last few weeks, and so I'm going to let her go ahead and get started, and then we'll take any questions at the end. Dr. Mani, I think you need to uh, exit your screen sharing. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Ooh. Ooh. Sorry, one second. Are you able to see my screen? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Buchanan, for that introduction. So yes, just to reiterate, I'm Mishma Farsi. I'm a fourth year at the Medical College of Georgia, and I'm going to be doing our case presentation for today. Um, Dr. Buchanan and I have been working on this the past couple of weeks, and we hope that it's useful for people in dermatology clinic, but also just in primary care as well. So starting off, this case is courtesy of Dr. Rabinovitz, 
And so we have a 79 year old male who presents for a routine skin check. He has a history of non-melanoma skin cancer. And physical exam is pretty unremarkable except for the left lateral lower leg has a scaly red plaque of unknown duration. So what do we see? Well, on physical exam, these are the findings that we see. And just upon quick visualization, we see some reddish brown scaly red plaque as mentioned before. So what handy dandy tool do we have? We have our dermatoscope. So before we get into that, we're gonna think about some differentials. Just upon seeing this, what do we start to think of? So a scaly red plaque, what pops into our mind? A pigmented basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, and you can think of a pink melanoma with focal brown. You can think of LPLK, so lichen planus like keratoses. And then let's take a closer look with our dermatoscope. So the dermoscopy findings are on the slide. And so let's go from left to right and see what's significant. So the first thing that we notice is the scale in the crust that kind of stands out to us. It's pretty prominent. And then below that, we can see vessels as red dots. And I apologize for the quality of these. This case is a little older, so the graphics are a little difficult to see, but hopefully the zooming in is helping. Moving over, we see some areas of homogeneous gray-brown. And then we see the brown dots that are arranged as radial lines. So our differential that we were thinking of before included basal cell carcinoma. And what are the significant dermoscopy findings that we think of with that? We think of arborizing vessels. And clearly, we do not see that on this image. And so it's really important to also focus on the vascular pattern. So the vessels as red dots should be what stands out. So step one, we think of, does the lesion manifest as one of the following benign patterns? So just a simple way, instead of going over all the chart, what do we think of? We think of symmetry, we think of color, and we think of organization. So looking back at the image, it's disorganized. We see many colors present, and it is not symmetric. So the answer to this is going to be no. Step two, does the lesion display any of the following patterns? And it actually does. And which one does it coordinate with? It is the squamous cell carcinoma. So going into the specific dermoscopy findings of squamous cell carcinoma, we see glomerular coiled vessels, white circles, brown circles, rosettes, brown dots radially arranged, yellow scale, strawberry pattern, and hairpin vessels with whitish halos. So let's look back at our image. So starting again from left to right, we see the scale and the crust. So we can see that on the right too. And then on the image, we see vessels as red dots, small coils. And it might be hard to visualize the small coils, but we will look at an image later on that will hopefully show that better. So you see the glomerular coiled vessels on the right as well. Then the brown dots arranged in radial lines. It's easier to visualize on the right. So this is the pattern that you would be seeking for that. So we are suspecting squamous cell carcinoma and we needed to confirm it via biopsy. Therefore, a shade biopsy of the lesion was performed with subsequent, subsequent pathological analysis. And Pathology was consistent with a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And just looking at the histopath, we can see the parakeratoses. And this kind of coordinates with the crusting, crust findings that we saw in dermoscopy. And then we can also see the atypical keratinocytes in the epidermis. And then the blue below just represents some solar elastosis. So for treatment, we're thinking of squamous cell carcinoma in situ on the left lateral lower leg. So there's multiple options that you can pursue. So I just listed a couple of um, options. So wide local excision, EDNC, topical chemotherapies. In this case, um, wide local excision was the most probable line of treatment. 
So just going back to a couple of teaching points in conclusion. So as I mentioned before, the vascular pattern in this case is very significant. So the vessels as red dots, when you see that you want to keep a broad differential. So going into more specifics about the vessels as red dots, as I mentioned before. So there's small red dots that you will see that will be 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 millimeters in size. And this is a good kind of blown up image of what you will find on dermoscopy. And so a reminder for the vessels as red dots, there are many conditions that can present with this. So they can be malignant, they can be benign, even inflammatory conditions. So it is important to keep a broad differential when you do see these. In our case, it was squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And then going back to our teaching points, an isolated pink scaly thin plaque, you always want to consider malignancy. So just looking at a couple of these examples, when you are looking at these lesions, we want to remember that context is key. Just because it is presenting as such does not mean that it's going to be malignancy, but we do want to keep that in the differential. For example, in these, it was not malignancy, but it did present similarly. So as, in our, as was seen in our case, biopsy is often needed to rule out the squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And lastly, don't forget to examine the whole patient. This is very important because if you are seeing these derm dermatoscopic findings on a lesion, you want to make sure that there are not many other lesions with the same patterns. Any questions? That was great. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the chat? So I think um, the teaching point here was that that pattern, the vascular pattern that we've spoken about in some of our earlier lectures last year. So again, just keeping that pattern in mind, especially when you see the scale with vessels as dots, um, that is, um, you know, a good pattern to remember that we see with squamous cell carcinoma often in situ. And so we have different treatment options for that. It's important to recognize but also just to reemphasize, you know, a lot of times in, in dermatology, patients just want to come in and they, they just want to say, hey, I got this one spot. But it's always important to kind of search for the other spots that they have that they might not be bothered by or bringing to your attention because it can, it can help narrow your differential diagnosis, perhaps prevent a biopsy and really um, sort of narrow your differential diagnosis and get them better treatment. So I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, Dr. Buchanan, in this yes. case, uh, this patient had a history of cancer, right? Uh, yes. So when we have this patient, uh, the recommendation to follow up is every six months, every three months, or every every year? It It really depends, you know, you have a lot of patients that will try to sort of dictate when they come to see you. Um, most people don't want to come to the doctor. So, I mean, if, you know, if this patient had a history of a malignant melanoma that was, you know, within the last couple of years, they're probably following very closely with a dermatologist, like every three to four months. Now, if, if they have a history of, you know, a few superficial basal cell carcinomas or squamous cell carcinoma in situ, and that's been sort of in the distant past, then they may only see you once a year. But a lot of our patients just have a history of chronic sun exposure. They're doing activities like golfing, things like that, that require them to be outside a lot. So most of our patients in my office with any sort of history of skin cancer other than an invasive melanoma are probably being seen about every six months. Thank you so much. I, I asking you this question because this is this is a question that I have a lot with the patient that they are not sure how often they, they should pain to to do a skin check. It's something common. Yeah, and, and it's gonna be a little bit different for every dermatologist, every provider, just depending on 
you know, the logistics of the practice, but usually when they have that history, um, six months is, is very appropriate for those patients, unless it's been, you know, 10 years or so since they've had a skin cancer. Thank you. And I, I would just say too, that some people are really good at doing their own self skin exams. And so they know when there's something new that's popping up. And then we have other people who are covered with a hundred seborrheic keratoses and they have such camouflage and, and lentigos from the sun that they couldn't possibly um, notice those changes, especially on the back. So I think it's very individual. You have people who are nervous Nellies who'd like to see you every, you know, two months because everything makes them nervous and the other people who wouldn't come back for 10 years. So I think uh, it is a compromise and, and very individual healthcare sometimes. Yeah, that's true. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great, great presentations today. Um, Mishma, you did a great job. And, um, and I have to say um, that Dr. Money, you showed um, that a picture is worth a thousand words because some of those pictures are pretty scary. Um, and I, I know I, for one, I'm not, I'm not someone who wears sunglasses a lot. And, um, but I think I'll um, be taking my sunglasses out um, and wearing them a little, <laughs> a little more often. Uh, now after seeing your presentation. So I want to thank um, both of you uh, for your presentations and, uh, and thank everyone else who um, asked questions and, uh, and, and made comments. Uh, so uh, those people who um, want, would like CME or CNE credit, the code is posted here. I think it's also in the chat and uh, and we'll be sending that out uh, again tomorrow uh, for, um, for you. And thank you for being here today. Our next session will be October 2nd on, on a Monday, four o'clock. And Dr. Rabinovitz will speak on the aging population, normal versus abnormal. I will be sure to pay <laughs> close attention to, um, to that presentation. And then we'll have a case presentation by another one of our uh, MCG medical students, Chandler uh, Johnson. Uh, reminder to our clinic providers to keep sending your consults in to um, Dr. Buchanan. And thank you all for attending today. And um, we will, we'll see you in a month. Anyone have any anything else to say before we chime off? Okay, well, um, guests, were, uh, you can uh, log out now. I'll remind our uh, Teladerm hub people to uh, stay on for uh, a couple extra minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>